think Ready? I think we can start now. We have enough of a quorum. Um, so welcome to this morning's uh, nephrology grand rounds. We are really excited to have Robert Schaverdian from uh, Hamburg, Germany, to talk to us about endovascular AVF. Um, he was actually uh, trained in Armenia, and then he moved to Germany a few years later uh, for more vascular surgery training. And about five years ago, he took over as head of the vascular access center at the Asclepios Clinic Barnbeck in Hamburg, where he uh, performs. I think he's now exclusively a vascular access surgeon, uh, and he performs all sorts of uh, even endovascular uh, vascular access procedures. Uh, including, you know, all the uh, innovative stuff that he's going to talk about today. I think he's got the most, uh, he was one of the first uh, vascular access surgeons to be using uh, both types of endovascular AV fistula creation. And at least in Europe and probably even worldwide, he has uh, the most experience uh, with using these uh, devices. So welcome and go ahead, Robert. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind invitation and introduction and um, thanks for having me and um, the kind words, kind introduction. Um, I will try to uh, show you a little bit uh, how um, and what type of endo-AV fistula creation systems are available, how they work, unless you, you know it, it's probably too much for you. But if you hear and see that for the first time, I will show you a part of the procedure, short version of it, and then give you some overview over uh, some available data and actually my experience. Here are my disclosures. Um, so one thing is as an introduction is when um, we as vascular access surgeons or um, you as nephrologists or everybody who is working with the dialysis patients uh, try to achieve is that we're trying to create a, a long lasting dialysis success with um, fewer patients who are um, on long term dialysis catheter with lower morbidity and mortality rates. And of course, the revision rates are also as fewer as possible. And one thing we shouldn't forget is that our patients should be satisfied with uh, whatever type of access they get. Some might be satisfied with a, a long-term catheter, um, some not. So basically what we want to achieve is the best possible dialysis success with the least possible failures, interventions, or revisions which is a dream, of course, because um, what the literature actually shows that the patency rates are not as good as we want them to be, uh, especially uh, the primary patency. But primary patency is not as interesting as, of course, the secondary patency rates, how long the access actually works. And um, it's it's actually um, shown, it has been shown in several studies with many, many patients including included. And when I say many, it's not something the nephrologists or cardiologists would expect from studies. When we have more than 100 patients in our uh, studies, then we're really happy this is nothing comparing to thousands. But still, this is the only thing we can work with. And we see that the secondary patency rates are not satisfactory and the failure rates are not satisfactory. Same is with regards to maturation, because basically we create those facial those accesses not to, to run, but also to be used. And uh, the maturation rates can be also um, failing in over 30 to 60 percent of cases, depending on the studies. And the other thing is usability of uh, vascular access of AV fistula. And you can see that here are uh, some studies with many patients, over 100 patients, hundreds of patients. And we can see that 60 percent of those are, are being used. And uh, if you if you compare it to the forearm radiocephalic fistula, those are even around the half that cannot be used or haven't been used. And um, to conclude it, what we know is that the AV fistula actually fail. And the uh, latest Kidoki guidelines <clears throat> recommend to create the right access at the right time in the right patient for the right reasons. Whatever those are, um, the typical vascular access creation locations for many vascular surgeons or transplant surgeons, depending on the country, would be radiocephalic, brachiocephalic, brachial basilic, and then AV grafts. Um, actually, in reality, we have different uh, and many other options. This is an algorithm we uh, have adapted several years ago in Hamburg. So basically, we would start as distal as possible, uh, individually based with a snuffbox fistula and proceed towards the upper arm. And um, when you also use the endo AV fistula uh, or the proximal forearm fistula, the grass type fistula, and even the ulnar um, basilic, so utilize the forearm basilic vein, you have actually my, many more options, native options um, for, for an, um, um, vascular access creation rather than those three or four. And the, the story behind the endo-AV fistula was initially that um, it was 
introduced as a something which when you create you don't um, harm the vessels during the creation of the anastomosis at least this is what the the, the companies the manufacturers tried to uh, to tell us and you would um, avoid the twisting or the kinking or the trauma to avoid uh, juxta anastomotic or anastomotic stenosis um, you would use ultrasound or um, x-ray um, instead of the um, wound exposure and also um, you could use some some areas for cannulations which would be affected if you create a surgical fistula this was the the, the initial uh, introduction but basically the actual goal what uh, for me was and is is that uh, endo av fistula actually expands anatomic options for uh, av fistula creation and it usually preserves the options for future surgical av fistula i, I i'm saying usually because um, when you have uh, failures after several years, you might have failures in some vessels which you would have been able to use for surgical fistula. So it's not 100% keeping the surgical fistula options open, but still in most cases it does. So it doesn't replace the surgical fistula, but it it is an addition. And we have two available systems, the Wavelink 4 French system, which is previously known as Everlink 6 French, and it is not available on the market. So I think everybody who's trying to, to publish data on Everlink system should consider that, that it's not available anymore. And it was acquired by BD Medical uh, several years ago and the Ellipsis system uh, previously from Avenue Medical, which was acquired by Medtronic around two years ago, I think. So one is a two cathode system, one is a one cathode system. And let's uh, see what they have um, as a similarity. The similarity is the perforating vein located in the anticubital fossa which communicates between the proximal forearm deep veins and the superficial upper arm veins. The anatomy can be different. It might be the cephalic vein, it might be the basilic vein, and it might be both. But if you don't have a perforating vein, suitable perforating vein, you can forget um, at least on label use of the NAV fistula creation for both systems. And for the Graz fistula, um, it, the perforating vein is actually used to create the surgical anastomosis between the anticubital brachial artery just before the bifurcation or the proximal radial or even proximal ulnar artery. So this is the similarity to the um, to the endo AV fistula. Basically, you need an outflow vein, the uh, suitable perforating vein and a proximal radial ulnar or distal uh, brachial artery. The ideal candidates for percutaneous AV fistula creation are actually the same patients um, who are either late stage CKD or already end stage uh, renal disease patients on or off permanent access. Um, if they have a failed uh, vascular access, whether it's a distal forearm fistula or even in some cases proximal upper arm if the perforating vein is not utilized or if they need to, to undergo um, uh, aphoresis. And also the same same thing where you, where you anticipate uh, longer life uh, and dialysis uh, than one year. Um, what we like to say is that not ideal candidate for wrist AVF, for radiocephalic AVF, uh, or not a candidate at all, uh, depends what you see as ideal, or if patients actually reject the forearm fistula, which is rare in Germany, but I have, I think I've created around four or five end fistula in patients who are candidates for radiocephalic fistula, and they rejected it. So um, one thing is in addition to that is that those patients have to meet the vascular anatomy parameters and I underline the word ideally um, because this is what I've learned within the last four and a half years since I've done the first endo AV fistula is that they don't, they shouldn't have the suitable anatomy as per IFUs. They need, to, they should have the ideal anatomy um, for the uh, risk of failure or against the risk of failure. Another thing is what's different between the surgical and endovascular fistula is that the endovascular AV fistula is a multiple outflow fistula or a polyfistula like John Ross from Orange Brook like to call it. And typically uh, when matured, it, it reaches around 500 to 800 flows um, per minute at one to four weeks. And uh, multiple outflow vessels are not only similar to if you would have created a Graz type fistula with basilic and cephalic outflow, but also a deep venous outflow is possible depending on the location of the anastomosis or possible underlying uh, stenosis. So those may require a procedure to direct the flow towards the target vein, which you anticipate to cannulate for dialysis. Another wavelength system, um, um, I already introduced it. Um, it, was, it was actually developed by William Cohn back then, and he got some, some innovation awards. 
So it was mod modified, and this is the last generation, uh, the four French or plus, we like to call it. So it's, it's still four French. It has two cathodes. There are four French cathodes, one for the fuel and one convenience success. Um, you use radiation, uh, you need a C arm, um, it's enough, an ultrasound uh, to introduce those cathodes to the anastomosis location. And the anastomosis is created between the um, between those cathodes. The venous catheter has the electrode. This is an important thing to know. And the arterial has the ceramic saddle. And using radio frequency um, energy of 0 0.76 seconds, it, it slices through those two vessels, the proximal radial artery and vein or ulnar artery and vein, and creates the um, kind of an anastomosis between those vessels. And because of the location of the anastomosis and mostly possible deep venous outflow, um, it is recommended to increase the um, resistance in that deep vein, mainly the one brachial vein, so that the blood would the blood would flow towards the lower resistance perforating vein and cephalic or basilic veins. So the coil embolization, and you don't have to put many coils to to complete the occluded. Um, usually, one to two coils are enough. It's just to increase the resistance and direct the flow towards the superficial veins. This is the location of the anastomosis you would create using the wavelength system. So there are two two locations, and mostly um, it's the lateral vein. In my experience, for radial, it can be also the medial vein, which goes into the perforating vein. But for the ulnar vein, it's in in practically all cases it's the lateral ulnar vein because. The median ulnar vein is actually communicated with a perforating vein using the bridges between the lateral and the medial uh, ulnar veins, and those bridges are not sufficient uh, to divert the flow towards the perforating vein. So if you create it with a medial ulnar vein, you almost always lose your flow towards the brachial vein, which you eventually coil, and then the blood will find uh, the right redirect towards the lateral vein or forearm veins. So just a tip from uh, from me. Um, you could introduce the catheters um, through the wrist, radial ulnar veins, uh, arteries, or uh, through the brachial accesses, and off-label use would be through the cephalic vein or basilic vein, uh, which um, you shouldn't plan because when you when you introduce the catheters towards your anastomosis location, the catheter, the venous catheter would divert towards the perforating vein and superficial um, vessels. So it will detach from the arterial catheter, which basically goes into the brachial artery. So this is a rare thing and don't plan for it. The candidates would be um, kind of remember size of two. The, in, the introduction vessels where you access vessels where you would introduce the catheters should accommodate four French catheters. So basically it's 1.5 millimeter vessels if you're able to cannulate them. Um, they are enough. Um, and for the uh, artery at the anastomosis, um, two millimeters. For the perforating vein, two millimeters. And for the outflow vein, two millimeters. Although, like I said, uh, ideally, bigger the bigger the vessels, the better the flow. And the distance between the artery and the vein where you create the anastomosis, since it's not fused, should be as little as possible. And I recommend nothing more than one millimeter because otherwise you will have an extravasation from that region because they're not fused. And um, schematically, um, like wrist excess here, ulnar vein, um, puncture introduction of the slender, five French slender sheath. Um, same with the ulnar artery in this case, uh, introduction of the wires, angiogram, introduction of the catheters. Um, you need to align them correctly. Um, you need to have a three-dimensional three image, which you don't have, so you need to really align them at the correct position as close as possible to the perforating vein. The further you go, the more flow you will lose. And then you have the fistula. And depending on your preference and the strategy, you either coil before you create the anastomosis, that brachial vein, or you uh, coil after. In this case, this example is kind of um, stupid, I would say, because you have a, a venous success from the wrist and then you can you, you puncture the brachial vein to introduce the coil. You can go through the venous excess and introduce the coil there. Um, either before you create the anastomosis or afterwards. The anastomosis is actually um, fused or there is an endothelium developed within the first 30 days and you can introduce the catheters, um, so the sheaths and the catheters either from the same side, um, we call it parallel access, or from uh, vice versa size, size. If you have a suitable um, wrist artery but not suitable wrist vein, you can introduce it through the brachial vein, so you have the anti-parallel access. And uh, you can recognize the tips of the catheters, this, this open windows, 
um, which uh, during the parallel access are on the same side on the left image and uh, anti parallel access uh, on the right side where you can see the opening uh, which which would recognize make you recognize the alignment of the characters from different sides. Now, how to perform the procedure? Um, you have this um, carbon um, arm table where you would like to um, have the arm on it uh, not being moved, and especially when you when you when you create the anastomosis, there is a slight electricity going through the body, so you need that ground electrode. Um, and then here is the um, ultrasound imaging prior to the procedure. The arrow is showing the perforating vein coming from the cephalic. You can see it goes behind the radial artery towards the lateral ulnar vein. This is the lateral ulnar vein, and this is the ulnar trunk. So they're really adjacent to each other, and that's the perforating vein going towards the cephalic vein. And this is not the only thing you need to recognize before planning, but this is already a planned case. So I try to uh, localize where I would like to create the anastomosis as close as possible to the perforating vein. And exactly at that location where I want to create the anastomosis, I either put a small small clamp, mosquito clamp, or a needle through the skin of the patient. And to note, we perform all the procedures under axillary block. And then uh, I just mark where the anastomosis would be so I will not have to do many flip venograms to identify the perforating vein. Now, this is the ultrasound guided introduction of the needle to the ulnar vein. You can see it slightly behind the calcified ulnar artery. And this is not something you should perform during the first cases. The firsts are usually bigger than two millimeters. So you have um, more experience. You take smaller vessels. I got lucky here. This is a 1.4 millimeter vein. There is a wire in the ulnar vein behind the muscle. I identify that it's intraluminal and then careful introduction of the five French slender sheath. So it, it has an outer diameter equivalent to four French, but inner diameter equivalent to five French. And then heparinized uh, saline to identify whether I'm in the lumen. So I don't, I don't do an angiogram here. Uh, ultrasound is mostly enough. Now we have the calcified non-dominant ulnar artery at the wrist. Um, and then you can see the introduction of the needle through the ulnar artery there. You can you can use the transverse mode or longitudinal mode. I always switch depending on the case here. It was easier with the longitudinal mode. Introduction of the wire also here. We can clearly see that the wire is intraluminal and then you introduce the, the sheath. Uh, what you do is when you come from the same side uh, with the sheath, you want to mark your arterial sheath um, because sometimes you might forget it. Um, and you just put a red cap on it so you know the red one is the artery. It is important to have it because uh, of the electrodes, because like I said, the, um, the catheter, the venous catheter needs to have the electrode and the arterial catheter is the one with the saddle. So you don't create a perforation in the artery. This is the venogram and you can see on the right side of the image, the lateral ulnar vein going towards the cephalic vein and on the left side, it was the basilic vein. Now um, I introduced the catheter, the wires um, through the um, artery and the vein, and this is the arteriogram. You can clearly see where the uh, ulnar trunk and radial artery, and then the ulnar uh, bifurcation are. So this is the space when I want to create my anastomosis, because the ulnar trunk is almost as big as the brachial artery, but after that, the vein and the artery um, get much smaller. Um, introduction of the catheter's um, alignment. You see the clamp on the left side of the image. So this is where I want to create my anastomosis based on the ultrasound. And then when you align them, attach them, you attach that pen um, and then just press, press the button. Um, you need to confirm that there is a ground electrode on the patient and you press the button. You can see that the catheters will move. So this is where it is important to fix the arm because the patient's arm might, might hit your face or their face. Um, but like I said, um, under a regional uh, axillary block, it's much easier and you have the vasodilation effect. And before you remove, um, you create the anastomosis, you remove the wires from the catheters, probably because you don't want to move the, uh, that electricity through the body. And before um, removing the catheters, you need to move them separately, not pull that both catheters because you will slice with the electrode through the vein and create an um, extravasation. You keep one and pull one and then uh, pull the other one. And then the final uh, arteriogram, so it's a fistulogram, you can see uh, coming from the ulnar artery, there is the anastomosis, um, like a jelly bean, we call it jelly bean. And then you see that the flow is going mainly to the cephalic vein. 
don't forget that this is an angiogram, so you don't see the amount of contrast of the flow. You can see the small brachial vein there and the big cephalic vein, but to confirm, I use ultrasound, and this is the B-flow image, so I see a really strong signal in the cephalic vein, which means that most of my flow is actually going into the cephalic vein, and that's why I decided not to coil the brachial vein here, and the flow is in the brachial artery here is 980 milliliters per minute. Removing the catheters at the wrist is much easier uh, for the arterial. You use this, this TR band from Tirumo. We have it from Tirumo. And you just inflate 18 cc's of air in, the, in that small pad and then just, just pull the catheters. So nobody has to stand there and compress it for the next 20, 25, 30 minutes. Um, you'll keep it for a couple of hours and then deflate it um, later. Um, initial evidence for the Everlink and then Wavelink systems was actually from, from Canada, interestingly. So there was the FLEX study, the NEAT study, and then the EAST study uh, with a four French catheter. And then there was the post-market study, which has never been published really. Um, there was some, I think it ended around two years ago. There is a publication which kind of includes some patients in it. And that's the, the one on the right side. So the main or the, the latest evidence for, for, for Wavelink, because I cannot go, through every publication would be the one from 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 Panos Kitro from Patras, Greece, who had uh, 30 patients uh, treated with the Wavelink four French system. And on the right side, the one from Todd Berland. So this is kind of a combination and continuation of the East study um, and East two study. And then they put 64 patients from the post market clinical study. So I recommend you all to read those papers to get your own opinion mm -hmm. on what the results are, for example, from the from the Greek study, we realized they only treated male patients with much, much bigger uh, vessel sizes, which kind of gives you um, the idea you need to treat uh, patients with really good anatomy to have better results. Now, um, going to the ellipsis system, this is Jeffrey Hall, who um, developed the ellipsis system catheter several years ago. This is a one catheter, six French catheter. It's um, used using only ultrasound guidance, so you're, you don't require X-ray. Um, it, it, it is using venous, cubital venous access to introduce this catheter, and it creates the anastomosis between the proximal radial artery and the perforating vein, or kind of where the perforating vein actually um, is joining the deep vein. Um, and it uses heat, thermal energy, and at the end of the procedure, since probably four years or five years, it is recommended to do the balloon angioplasty of the anastomosis using a five millimeter balloon because your sheath is there, your wire is there. Um, that's the reason was because during the initial pi pi pivotal study, they realized that more than 80 percent require range intervention uh, after a week. So um, Alex Malice from Paris um, said, let's try to use the balloon after the first procedure or during the first procedure. And it uh, reduced the um, amount um, of secondary interventions at that region. This is basically where the anastomosis is created at the proximal radial artery and how it's created a needle wire sheath catheter and close it and create the anastomosis. This is the schematic view of that procedure. Let's see whether it works. Um, so around around two fingers cranially to where you would create the anastomosis, you puncture the cubital vein, medial or lateral, depending on anatomy ultrasound guided introduction of the needle into the radial artery. And then when this is kind of the most difficult part of this procedure, um, three dimensional movement of the needle through the perforating vein to the radial artery. And then you have the also thin walls, slender six French sheath um, to um, accommodate that uh, ellipsis catheter. You introduce the sheath into the radial artery. You exchange the wire. Um, you need an O14 wire for the ellipsis catheter. And then uh, when you remove the dilator, you can introduce the catheter through the sheath, which is still in the, in the radial artery. The catheter um, has an open tip. Um, it, it, it connects to a generator. I will show it to you so you can see how big the tip is. When your tip is in the radial artery, you pull back the sheath. You basically close the catheter and attach the anterior wall of the radial artery with a vein. And then by pressing the button, it, it burns a hole in it. And simultaneously, it really fuses that connection. And hence, you're able to do an anastomosis uh, angioplasty directly after the creation, which we as vascular access surgeons would never imagine to, to balloon an anastomosis, which we just created minutes ago. 
and then you remove the sheath press press uh, just for five to ten minutes and, and, and it's ready. This is the location of the anastomosis um, where you would ideally have this type of anatomy. And um, it's also similar to the to the wavelength uh, sizes. Remember the two, two millimeter radial artery, two millimeter perforating vein and outflow vein, of course. But the thing is that the distance between the artery and the vein should be less than 1.5 millimeter. If it's bigger, you have a risk of uh, extravasation also here. And this is actually how the procedure is. We have a tourniquet um, also in case of wavelength before the venous puncture. This is the power generator. It is really easy. There are two buttons. It's not a touch screen. You just press the button to calibrate it. And this is the ultrasound prior to the procedure. The cephalic vein, you can see follow the perforating vein. And the perforating vein is really going towards the radial artery. We can see on the left side the bifurcation. So this is the perforating vein exactly on the radial artery a location where you would create the anastomosis. Don't go too high when it's actually going far away from the artery. And then uh, around two fingers um, above where you would anticipate your anastomosis, you puncture and you follow the needle through the middle, try to keep it in the middle of the vein, and you just slowly go with a probe and the needle. So you need to see the tip of the needle, otherwise you might perforate the back wall or elsewhere. And when you reach the radial artery, Sometimes it's easier just to use the transverse mode and then you pop through the arterial wall and then you're in the radial artery. This is actually a live image. Uh, mostly it is as fast as it is when you have done around 10 cases. You're, um, it's going to be much easier. This is the needle in the radial artery. You see you have no dissection. Your wire is in the radial artery and then you introduce the sheath, the six, six French sheath again. Um, better under ultrasound guidance, so you see that it's not going through the back wall. Exchange the wire, remove the um, dilator. You can see the wire in the radial artery. This wire is 80 centimeters long, so when the half is in, it's enough. You can see the tip of the ellipsis catheter now going into the radial artery. The, the generator tells you how big the opening is, usually seven millimeters. You pull back the sheath and then you pull back the catheter. And when you pull back the catheter, you can see that the back part is now in the vein and the tip is attached to the anterior wall of the radial artery. Don't tear it, but just slightly pull it to see that it's actually holding there. Close the tip of the device with a, with a grip on the catheter. And then again, you can see that it's attached. And then you ask the nurse to press the button. When they press the button, there is the heating uh, sound for three seconds and you can see now the bubbles coming out and then the second one is the cooling phase so there are three heating and three cooling phases to cool the catheter and the cooling phase is a little bit longer and then during the third phase you you slightly pull the catheter and as soon as everything is burnt out kind of the catheter is is, is coming back to the perforating vein you confirm with the color that you have an anastomosis you have a fistula flow in the perforating vein and then you, here comes the uh, balloon. This is a five times 20 millimeter balloon. One third of the balloon is in the radial artery. Two thirds is in the perforating vein. So this is a monorail Boston Scientific ultra soft balloon, which is a uh, compliant balloon. So you don't have any problems with tearing that radial artery unless it's really small and it's calcified. And then you wouldn't create that fistula. And you can see that the catheter in the middle, almost in the middle is the anastomosis. When you inflate the balloon, um, not the catheter, the balloon, you can see how that, that anastomosis is actually opening up. We keep it for two minutes and then you can see much stronger signal in the perforating vein. Also, when you activate, uh, when you're familiar, if you're familiar with a B-flow, you can activate the B-flow to see how strong it is. It's just something you not necessarily need, but I use sometimes to see there is a clear, strong signal. There is a black shadow of the sheath in the middle, so it's not a thrombus or something. And then, uh, of course, also here, like after every AV fistula creation, we measure the flow in the brachial artery, um, unless it's an axillary bifurcation to see um, how the flow is. And if the vessels are big, if the patients are young, you can inflate that balloon not too much. If you have a smaller vessels, you need more flow, you inflate a little bit more, that five millimeter balloon is sufficient enough. Now, there have been also some, some evidence um, for, for the ellipsis catheter initial results, mostly from Jeffrey Howe, the developer, um, and from Alex Malice from Paris. We had um, also presented um, from, from Hamburg some experience. And um, the, the, the biggest ones would be from Gerald Bethard, 
which showed uh, the two years patency rates, which were excellent over 90% secondary patency rates. And um, from, from Paris, the biggest study with over 200 patients um, were also published in Journal of Vascular Surgery. This is something which actually came out this year from Jeffrey Hall. This is, these are the results, five years results of that pivotal study, multi-center trial from, from the United States. And this is actually something which showed, even though there are not so many patients left after five years, but they had 92% of fistula use, 92% functional patency, and 82% of cumulative patency or secondary patency rates through five years. And this is something, the only thing available for NDAV fistula for this uh, long uh, period of time. There is only uh, one study which I published uh, two years ago, which included both catheters, ellipsis, and wavelength systems. There were 100 patients um, available in um, JVR, um, open uh, access, and um, some publications also have been uh, published comparing endoavi fistula with a surgical fistula, and um, one compared the wavelength with radiocephalics. Uh, for the Paris uh, group compared ellipsis with most types of surgical fistula. We have compared the ellipsis with a similar surgical grass type fistula. And there is also one comparing um, so small group, 24 patients ellipsis with brachiocephalic AV fistula. Most of the studies demonstrated that the endo AV fistula are not worse than surgical fistula. The last one showed that the brachiocephalic is better than uh, ellipsis fistula which is also logical because of the anastomosis between the brachial artery and the radial artery and not the radial artery. Um, but one thing is to consider there is no exact comparison of surgical fistula to the end of the fistula because of, like I said, the location and the type of the anastomosis. And there is also one systematic review of those published, uh, published um, um, endovascular systems with both. And um, it also showed that the um, the, the percutaneous AV fistula is safe, it's comparable, it's not much worse, although there might be more interventions um, for end AV fistula rather than for the surgical one, depending on centers and studies. In perfect conditions, they, they would look like this. Um, it, it shouldn't be convincing uh, for the patients, especially because the patients want an access which works. They usually, usually don't um, mind a small scar from the surgical fistula creation. So this is not an argument, but this is, for example, an argument um, which we have actually published. It's a case report of one patient, but that pa one patient proved that due to the location of the, uh, or has proven due to the location of the anastomosis slightly distally to each other, you can create all three systems, the wavelength and the fistula, the ellipsis, and the surgical grass type fistula in the same arm in the same patient successfully if one fails, because when they fail early, they typically fail at the Jackson anastomotic anastomotic level. And due to that case and experience with both systems, um, we have in implemented the endo AV fistula systems both in that uh, algorithm from distal to proximal, again, individually based, where we would start from the snapbox fistula, radiocephalic, in some cases, ulnar basilic, and then move towards wavelength in ideal conditions, ellipsis, and then surgical grass type fistula. That is why we practically don't create upper arm brachiocephalic AV fistula, um, because most of them have perforating vein to create a uh, grass type or endovascular AV fistula. Um, ultrasound is one of the main things I would like to, sh to go um, into that shortly. Um, and if you wonder what's an ultrasound, you might know this type of machines. Um, from the earlier years, now we are using something like that, ultrasound with an iPhone or a mobile phone. But one um, thing is to consider the ultrasound is required for every step of endo AV fistula success, but the planning is the one of the most crucial things. Before I start the mapping, I have this clear sheet, um, and then when I map the upper arm, I already know whether there is a cephalic and or basilic vein outflow. Um, available and the very, there is a perforating vein for a surgical grass type fistula and then um, we dive into the um, more closer anatomy because if you don't have perforated you don't have to do it if you have it you want to see okay this is the something where i can, can create an ellipsis this is big this is exactly at the radial artery you measure the sizes you can use the longitudinal projection too um, to recognize that and this is something uh, you need experience with
For example, here you can see also brachial vein going from the perforated vein on the left side um, towards the brachial artery. You need to consider if it's too big, you will lose a lot of flow when you create an endoavi fistula with both systems. And then um, I look into the forearm, is there a radiocephalic fistula possible? And then go back to the brachial artery and veins to see whether I can um, create the um, wavelink, introduce the wavelink catheters and whether the arterial system is, is, you know, is okay. Um, then you can see the proximal radial artery and veins, whether they are suitable. And it's not just the location. You need to have the continuation. If you anticipate to create here the anastomosis, then you need to make sure that the whole distance between that anastomotic area towards the perforator and your outflow vein are actually big enough, sufficient enough. And then um, the ulnar region is the most difficult. You saw already the, uh, the anatomy during the case presentation, and this is behind the muscle. It requires a lot of experience to identify that breach, the ulnar breach between the ulnar vein and the perforating vein, the distance. And again, you need to make sure that your catheters can be aligned here. If you don't have a brachial vein coming from that lateral ulnar vein, then your catheter will not be parallel to the arterial line. It will just spiral around it or it will go into the perforating vein and you're actually not able to create the anastomosis at this location. Sometimes the longitudinal projection helps. You can see here the three vessels, the ulnar trunk and two ulnar veins. And on the, the upper one is the lateral one. And you can see the ulnar communicating with a perforating vein like an S shape or a Z shape. So this is the breach um, and Sometimes it's really easier to see it in the longitudinal projection. And then radial artery and radial veins. Can I introduce the catheters? Sometimes the veins are spiraling around the artery. Sometimes they're switching from the medial to lateral side. Of course, the flow in the radial artery to see whether there is a tri triphasic flow or not. And the same with the ulnar. And after I perform that mapping, I have this, this, this images, drawings of the whole possibilities including the sizes of all vessels and the uh, uh, availability or possibility to create the ellipsis wavelink, medial or lateral. Both components actually provide you with specific sheets, but since I'm not only mapping the patients for the end of fistula, I'm uh, doing all on one sheet. And um, if, if it was too fast, uh, you can actually look into the endovascular today. In June, I've published a stepwise approach to how to, to go through mapping, and there is actually also a small video of the mapping. It might help you uh, long term to read it um, and um, see the video how it works. Now, with regard to my experience, um, one thing is, for example, how many patients are actually suitable for uh, generally AV fistula creation, surgical or endo-AV fistula. I've screened more than 550 patients and two thirds of my patients are actually male. Um, and when you look into the um, surgical AV fistula, you can see that almost half of the patients can actually get radiocephalic AV fistula, including a snuff box. And 80%, almost 80% have a perforating vein suitable for a Gratz type AV fistula with an outflow vein and suitable arterial system. And for the endo AV fistula, you need that extra anatomical criteria that's why the numbers are going lower than 80%. For ellipsis, these are 53% and for wavelink, almost 30%. Because there is an exclusion, either the distance between the artery and the vein is big, or there is no communication between the arch, the vein and the perforating vein, or there is no, no suitable introduction access vein to introduce the catheters, which will reach that destination. But around 60% can get at least one system, endo-AVF system, and for both systems, actually 22% of the patients are suitable. This actually has led to, to around 800 creations since I work in Hamburg, and 92% are actually AV fistula, and 8% are grafts uh, for rare cases, rapid cannulation hero grafts. And when you look, we have done uh, more than 20, uh, 25%, so 201 endo AV fistula creations, but most of the patients have actually a forearm fistula, whether it's a snuff box, or a radiocephalic using the vascular device. Those are the radiocephalic fistula, around the half of them. Some Gratz fistula, 135. So 94% of the uh, AV fistula are actually um, below elbow anastomosis. So radiocephalic or uh, some ulnar um, based ulnar artery or Gratz or any AV fistula. When you look into the results of the most, most groups we have done in Hamburg, we see almost similar demographics um, for the snuff box. We have more younger and 
uh, male patients for the grads are already longer on dialysis, have more distance, distal accesses and more female patients. But the technical success for NDAV fistula is really high, around 100% um, for ellipsis and 93 for wavelength. Um, we couldn't attach the catheter, so there was no anastomosis being able to create with a wavelength system in four cases. Um, but when you look into the um, important criteria, such as maturation rates, for example, at four weeks we are doing an ultrasound ass uh, assessment of every AV fistula we create. We can see that uh, for, for the ellipsis system, they are really comparable to the GRAD system, around 80% are mature at four weeks. Um, and I mean for physiological maturation, the wavelength is behind. We had more failures within the first four weeks to abandon. And uh, this one is the radiocephalic actually with a vascular device. It, it has excellent results, which is not part of this topic. But when you look into the total maturation rates, we have almost 90% for ellipsis and grads and almost 80% for wavelength. So it is comparable and even higher. And uh, if you look into the clinical maturation, so the excess has been used in dialysis patients, if they required it, you see that 92% for ellipsis uh, and AV fistula is, pre is pretty high if you compare, especially to the literature of the surgical fistula. Um, we didn't have any relevant complications. We see some high flow, especially in the Graz fistula when they have the anastomosis with the brachial artery. Also with the endoavi fistula, no, non-symptomatic, but still, and we have only seen one um, still in an ellipsis patient with type 1 diabetes and 4% um, of grads. Primary patency rates are bad in all AV fistula. There are wars in the endo AV fistula. The patients require actually, more patients require an intervention. So that's why uh, up to four years from the beginning on, the primary patency rates are low. Um, the assistant patency rates though, and the secondary patency rates are pr pretty high. If you look into the secondary patency rate here, the um, ellipsis is kind of the winner with the Graz fistula. Um, and just to make it easier for you to understand, this, those are the four years patency rates. You see that the endo fistula patients require more interventions, more patients, but not significantly more interventions per patient year. Um, but the assistant patency rates and the secondary patency rates are really high um, especially for the ellipsis system. Like I said, Wavelink is behind. We, we were losing uh, many more Wavelinks. And um, if you look into the intervention rates, um, you see that 43% of the Wavelink patients and 53% of ellipsis patients actually required an intervention, 0 to 5, 0 to 7 interventions per patient. When you look into the number of interventions per patient years, it's actually not um, like one or two, like in the surgical AV fistula in the literature, it's 048 and 062. And most of the intervention are actually uh, angioplasty at the Jackson anastomotic region. That's the most of the locations for the AV fistula. The interventions are commonly necessary and are mostly endovascularly possible. And um, one just last thing is the cannulation of the AV fistula. You need to... Um, Consider that it's a low pressure system. You cannot uh, palpate at a uh, garden horse. Um, I recommend always putting a tourniquet and initially always using ultrasound guidance to cannulate. Um, depending on the country and availability, plastic cannula um, is something you should consider at the beginning, early uh, cannulations. Those veins don't have that thick wall because of the non-singular outflow. Um, so both companies support actually some kind of local training for cannulations and it is also possible to perform um, y type cannulations at the elbow the median cubital and the uh, cephalic cubital cephalic vein and due to that low pressure system we see rarely aneurysms uh, due to aerial cannulations or cephalic arch or basilic swing point stenosis rarely meaning I've seen that, but not so common. And this is an example of a six days old um, ellipsis and AV fistula in a patient who never had a vascular access previously. And he had an infected tunnel dialysis catheter, which we removed three days ago. And then uh, we decided to create the ellipsis and then cannulate it on day six using ultrasound guidance. And you can see our nephrologists are using this small GE ultrasound machine to cannulate it successfully. And uh, after two, two dialysis sessions at our hospital, at our dialysis unit, um, the, dial the cannulations were uh, performed at this dialysis unit, um, even then without the ultrasound guidance. So um, my patient's endo-AV fistula journey is usually 
the importance ultrasound mapping to uh, consider suitability for endo AVF if, if they are suitable, not only anatomically, but also um, no distal fistula creation is possible. Then the procedure uh, under axillary block, I perform another ultrasound to see the vasodilation. Sometimes I create a surgical fistula, forearm fistula, if they were not suitable. And then uh, you measure the flow, of course. Um, I usually measure the flow after two days, one uh, first and second day to see whether there is an increase of the flow. Usually if there is around 30% decrease, that is a good sign for maturation. And then at four weeks, I always see them to either start cannulations or perform a secondary intervention to either direct the flow or do an angioplasty or whatever. And strict follow-up is also important because something might change. You might have cephalic outflow and then after one year it's dominant basilic, but the nurses are cannulating the cephalic vein. So I recommend every three to six months um, an ultrasound. So to conclude, usually an AV fistula is possible in over 90% of patients with endo AV fistula in 60%. So we have a lot of possibilities to create vascular access in our patients and native fistula access. Thermal mapping is crucial and good management, planning, surveillance um, are leading to high maturation, cannulation and secondary patency rates. And another, again, another point, it's not a replacement. It's an excellent addition to surgical AV fistula. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was wonderful. It's uh, it's fabulous to see uh, those videos and not just uh, read about these papers. So that was really well done. Now, uh, if people have questions, please raise your hand and unmute yourself. Uh, but I'll start the ball rolling by asking, um, you know, a simple one is that you, you make it look very easy uh, <laughs> when you're showing this. But, you know, you obviously have a huge experience which shows how steep is the learning curve in, uh, again, you know, I won't be doing it. Uh, my colleagues, either interventional radiology or vascular surgeons would be involved, but how steep is the learning curve? It looks like uh, complicated uh, anatomically from uh, my perspective. Yeah, well, the thing is that the surgical AV fistula creation is also something one needs to learn. And like everything else, this also requires a learning curve, you're right. And my disadvantage was that I was kind of learning from doing myself at that time. There were practically no experts worldwide to ask for an advice and you had to think and you had to do to to recognize sometimes you did a, an anastomosis between the median and ulnar vein and realized it's not going to flow into the perforating vein now i can tell you that um but depending on the ultrasound skills and and i think that the ultrasound skills are most important even if if you're a radiologist and you're familiar with a lot of interventions the ultrasound skills are the most important part because the failure occurs if you do not plan them correctly. If you just look into the anastomotic area and say, okay, I'm going to perform a wavelength procedure. And then during the procedure, you actually cannot introduce any catheters to your location, to designated location. So the ultrasound skills are one thing. Um, and also knowing vascular access, especially the anatomy at that region is also another thing. I had an advantage of having experience with both endovascular uh, AV procedures or generally vascular uh, surgery procedures and also with surgical grass type fistula. So the anatomy was something I didn't have to learn except of that ulnar vein, which we never used. And with wavelength, we had to learn it. Um, so when I look into the experience I've seen with myself and with some colleagues I had to train, um, you, you usually need to consider the first around five to 10 cases are going to be hard. Um, when, when you perform an ellipsis and it's eight minutes to 10 minutes, the first ones will be 40, 45 minutes. And I've seen wavelength cases which lasted two to three hours. Um, my first were also around one and a half hour. So uh, different factors actually play the role. But if, if you have good understanding of the va vasculature of the ultrasound preoperatively, um, then the rest is experience and um, the more you do, the more you, um, the, the better you get, you know, like everything else. Yeah, yeah, that, that's probably true. Uh, we do have some, uh, I think we have a vascular surgeon and some interventional radiologists. So if you have questions, please uh, unmute yourself and ask. Um, our, our vascular surgery chief had to leave halfway through, but he sent me a question to ask you. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, uh, how the systems work in Germany, but there's a question of cost. Uh, these things are expensive uh, and, and surgical fistula is, you know, not that expensive. Yeah. So how, how does to, one, to how should one think about that? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's usually the typical argument. The suture is 30 cents and the catheter is 3,000 euros or whatever it is. Um, yeah, that's an argument. And there is actually no real cost effectiveness uh, analysis performed due to several factors. There is some study in JVA, which I wouldn't recommend to uh, to read because I think it's bollocks, which says that waveling is much cheaper than the historical Italian surgery. Um, I, I never consider that it's it's something you could compare with historical data from somebody who's done three surgeries in a year and has really bad results. Um, the catheter is more expensive, um, but we have to look into the big, big picture. Um, this is an additional site. We have patients, who, at least in Germany, who wait uh, for a kidney transplant for over 10 years, if any. So we have to give them many possibilities for a long-term dialysis access before we switch the arm to the other arm, before we start doing more complex things. And if I if I have to pay or my hospital, the health insurance or the system has to pay a couple of thousand euros for a patient who might get a running fistula for another three years or five years or maybe two years, you never know, um, then there is nothing you could say with this is expensive because you look at it from the patient's perspective and it, you're not replacing that surgical fistula. That's the difference. And let, let's be honest, most of the surgeons create a brachiocephalic AV fistula instead of the endo AV fistula. And then after two years, you have cephalic arstenosis, you have a high flow AV fistula, you have a cardiac burden, toxicity, you have steel, you have the aneurysm, you have to resect it, you have to bend it, you have to treat the cephalic arstenosis. So those costs you also need to consider. Uh, of course, the endo AV fistula also bring costs for secondary interventions. But the thing is, th those devices are new. There are still probably newer devices coming out within the next years. People working on maybe competitive devices to reduce the prices. With the endovascular aortic repair, it was the same. Everybody who was talking about it, I don't know, 20 years ago, was booed out of the uh, stage. And um, because there are endovascular systems which were around 20,000 euros worth, and now it's a standard because it developed, the prices went down, there are a lot of competing products, there is more experience. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that that's very uh, relevant. Um, and that uh, the the mention about the brachial, um, you know, uh, basilic fistula was my next question. Is that should we we are not going to compete? You know, if you know the endovascular fistula doesn't compete necessarily with surgical, but if it does, it's that we would perhaps do less upper arm fistula and do more endo AVF. But do you think that you are creating endo AVF in people who otherwise would not get an AV fistula at all? No, I don't think so, because um, I, I cannot say that there is a patient who couldn't get a surgical fistula but got an endovascular AV fistula. You, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not uh, someone who is doing them under local anesthesia. Um, we do axillary block. Most of the cases, you have a patient who is relaxed. You have um, vasodilation, which helps you with the flow and with the procedure. And if you can create an endovascular AV fistula, you definitely can create a Grads type fistula or a brachiocephalic, even if you want to, or a forearm fistula. It's the axillary block works up to the mid upper arm. So um, I've never had to create an endo fistula in patient who couldn't have a surgical fistula. But it just gives you more options, so you can you know move from one to the other, to the you know saving the upper arm to people who have you know failed distal fistula. Is that how you think about it? Yeah, most of the cases actually fail at the Jackson osteomotic region. Um, also, also for the both end AV fistula. Of course, you can trash the cephalic vein during the years of the cannulations, but then um, the still the Jackson osteomotic problem is the most, most common. And if it fails there, you still can proximalize the anastomosis. Same with the snuffbox fistula. When it fails at the anastomosis, you create a radiocephalic AV fistula or you create a proximal radiocephalic fistula. It's not hundred percent. You might have a failure in the cannulation zone or your artery might be damaged sooner or later um, and I'm limited to up to five years yeah I don't know what happens in 20 you know exactly that. there was someone trying yeah. to ask a question yeah yeah Peter Magna yeah <clears throat> a couple of questions uh, I missed <clears throat> what proportion of your patients are suitable for fistula and what proportion never get a fistula or can't have one 
We're anatomically um, based on the ultrasound. Um, 92% of our patients get a fistula. So it seems like quite a different experience than here, and I don't know if it's patient characteristics or operator characteristics and willingness to. Uh, I think it's both. With, with small vessels. Uh, and are, are our patients older with worse vascular disease or worse veins? Not sure. And that's been an ongoing debate for years because that was yeah. the experience years ago that Europeans had way more fistulas than Canadians. Um, and uh, a, a second question is you had one slide talking about these uh, not being uh, high pressure, hypertrophied, arterialized veins, and therefore needing ultrasound to cannulate. Is that an ongoing thing, or do they eventually become bigger and easier to palpate and uh, cannulate manually, or is it always going to require ultrasound guided cannulation? Um. Yes, I don't know whether you want me to comment on the first one. Um, I think that um, if you look into the Japanese Asian uh, surgeries, they have much more fistula. They have only fistulas uh, created. So it definitely depends on the uh, population and also on the surgeons. I know people who, who consider a 2.5 millimeter vein as not suitable, and I consider a 2 millimeter vein suitable. Same with a radial artery. If I create a radial cephalic, a 1.6 millimeter artery lumen would be sufficient enough if the uh, the rest is good. So this is one thing. And the other thing is um, if they have really completely trashed veins due to the previous catheters, injections, um, around half of my patients are still chronic kidney disease patients. Um, we try to save the vein, uh, but it never happens. Even our nephrologists put, put cannula in the same arm in the elbow. Um, it might be also like both. I think it's a both both side thing. Maybe the nephrologists refer too late. Maybe the nephrologists don't uh, start pointing out, keep save your veins, keep it safe, and then the surgeons consider it as small, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second one is with the cannulations. Actually, it, it, it gets better during the time. So at the beginning, it's uh, it's different, uh, but you don't have to cannulate every patient using ultrasound guidance for 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 forever. And the first couple of weeks, it's um, easier, and then um, basically what you also have is you mark your uh, cannulation area on the skin, so the nurses uh, or the physicians can can see where the cannulations occurred within the last weeks. And when you put a tourniquet, uh, and if 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 it's not a skinny patient. You cannot really hard, hardly palpate it, but you can see where the cannulation zones are. You basically manage to cannulate it without ultrasound. So I don't remember any patient of mine who had to have long-term ultrasound guided cannulations. Most of the dialysis units drop that ultrasound and only use it if it's really difficult. And I don't remember any of them long-term needing that. Thank you. Uh, I know it's nine, but if you can stay on, there are some more questions. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. So uh, Adnan, uh, so Adnan's the chief of our interventional radiology and who might be doing these. Go ahead, Adnan. Thank you. And thanks for the great presentation. Uh, uh, is there, um, well, unfortunately in Ottawa, it's gonna take probably 10 years to get to anywhere close to this technology. Judging by the history of of, uh, of our getting new devices in, uh, but in case we do, is there one device that you would pick over another that might be easier to start with? Uh, yeah. Uh, and do you uh, would you? I, I know you have both devices in your uh, in your practice, and then you can pick one depending on the anatomy of the veins. Uh, is that what you would envision most centers to have both devices on the shelf? Thanks. Um, first of all, you need to confirm that there is no, nobody from, from both of the companies uh, <laughs> joining us <laughs> before I answer your first question. Um, well, if you if you ask me which one I would choose, I would definitely say the ellipsis catheter. Um, and it is based on the ultrasound mapping. The ultrasound mapping is much easier than um, for the wavelength. Um, and when you when you do a couple of the, uh, patients, you see how 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 difficult and different it is to try to recognize that 
especially the Alna region, and then where where the catheters will come in, how they will come in, will they attach there? So it it is a step more difficult. The procedure itself is for me also much easier for ellipsis than for wavelink. I've started with wavelink, and then I think after half a year I did the first ellipsis case. Um, one helped the other one, like the ultrasound guided cannulation of the wrist vein became more easier, much easier when I started doing ellipses and vice versa. Um, but procedure for ellipse is also much easier for me. And if you look into the results I have, the ellipses has also much better results. I can keep more ellipses um, AV fistula running because uh, the reintervention is much simpler rather than for wavelength. Especially, for example, if, if if I have an like an example, if I have an occluded perforated vein in an ellipsis, I can perform similar procedure like the ellipsis procedure. I just do a sharp recanalization, ultrasound guided introduction of the needle through the perforating vein into the radial artery and balloon it. It's like 10 minutes later, it's running again. If I have an occluded ulnar vein uh, or a radial vein, it's it's much much difficult, if probably sometimes impossible, to recanalize it on this at, at this region. You need to have to be a radiologist and uh, invest much more time to try to to go through a radial vein you practically don't see anymore because there is no no sign to identify where it is except of the anastomosis maybe that jelly bean. So this would be a clear answer ellipsis. The second one is I think that at the beginning um, one should stick with one system. Um, I had a different situation. I, I was exclusive so I could convince my hospital to to try a second one, ellipsis one, and then when when we saw how great it is, we kind of continue to use both and that algorithm and distal to proximal things. But um, when you start, just start with one, uh, get confident with that one, um, and then um, when you have done enough cases, and I would say probably twenty, you shouldn't you shouldn't say okay, I've done three, two failed because maybe there was something, whatever. Just do around twenty and see whether the whole package is working with you or for you. Um, and then you might say, OK, I have I, I have so many patients. I don't know how many patients you have. You know, if you only had do three to four endo-AV fistula creations per year, you probably don't need both systems. You just stick with the one you uh, you have. If you do around 650 AV fistula procedures so like I do per year, then um, I, I, I'm, I'm better with both of them, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dana. Hi, um, I uh, just had a couple of questions about um, use of the um, endovascular created fistulas. Um, so how long are you waiting for uh, maturation? Like, so on a traditional, we're going four to six weeks, usually closer to the six weeks before we consider cannulation. Is there any difference with the endovascular? Yes, um, you're probably a nurse, right? Yes, <laughs> I'm the access coordinator. <laughs> yeah, because you're asking about cannulations. Um, so basically, it's the same for me for all type of fistula. I'm, I'm doing a follow up at four weeks, and my experience says if the fistula is not matured at four weeks, it will not be matured at 12 or 15 or 20. So we know from the literature that physiological maturation kind of completes at around three weeks. So my experience shows, I, I think I had one case only, that if it's not mature at four weeks, um, there is an issue. There is an inflow problem mostly, so there is a juxta anastomotic anastomotic issue. And because I don't want to lose the time and keep the patients on catheter for another three months or six months, if it's not mature at four weeks, I will do a reintervention uh, like a balloon assisted maturation procedure, like Americans like to call it, BAM, and then uh, initiate cannulations as soon as possible. So the same is for the endo AV fistula. Uh, I will do an evaluation at four weeks. Um, and it also depends on what you consider as a maturation, right? So there are people saying six, 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 and there are people saying five, five hundred at four weeks. Where my dialysis uh, units are confident with five millimeter, five hundred flow, and target vein flow of uh, over three hundred. So if I have an endo AV fistula with dual outflow and there is flow mostly more than 500 when they're mature, I will look in the target vein if it's the cephalic one has more than 300. If not, whether the, there is a cubital opportunity to, to do the cannulation, if it's the basilic dominant, um, and then it's it's considered as mature. Um, there is a group in the UK which says four millimeter is mature. 
I don't think that uh, maybe Japanese can cannulate four millimeter vessels. The US Americans uh, will not cannulate a vessel which is smaller than a centimeter probably. So it's really different how you actually see the maturation as physiological maturation. But at four weeks, if the endave fistula has good total flow, good target vein flow, it gets the cannulations. If it has good total flow, low target vein flow, then the question is why? Is it going into the basilic vein? Then we need to see whether we need to divert the flow to the cephalic vein or whether it's going to the deep venous system because there is a perforating vein stenosis and your total flow is excellent, but it's everything is going into the deep venous system. Then you need to treat that jackstanostomotic perforating vein stenosis to reduce the uh, resistance towards the perforating vein and whether you coil or ligate your brachial vein secondarily is depending on your center. Okay, thank you. You didn't have a follow-up question, Dana, or that was it? No, he but already answered questions. my follow-up questions <laughs> in, in your answer, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. You knew uh, what she was going to ask. So uh, thanks again uh, for that excellent presentation and, and really uh, passionate discussion. Uh, and, and thanks for staying longer to answer all our questions. Uh, whenever we are ready to begin with this, I'm sure we'll get back to you uh, with more Anytime. questions uh, and, and advice and guidance, of course. Um, so for the listeners, uh, you will be getting an email with the um, survey for evaluations. Please uh, do fill those out and uh, we'll give some feedback. And thanks again, Robert. I hope we meet uh, sometime in person, but uh, you know, there is a silver lining to the pandemic is that we could have you present uh, uh, from, uh, from Hamburg. Thank you so much. Thanks again for having me.